passage in Isaiah might be familiar to you or may not be. This is really what we want to do today on uh, this Sunday. I'm not on. I'm not on. I'm not on. I guess what we really want to do this Sunday, uh, being the Bethlehem candle, the candle of love, is uh, we want to take a look at who Jesus is. Uh, what's amazing to me is, uh, unfortunately, through the years, one of the things that pastors have to do, and by the way, in uh, three weeks, I will have been a pastor for 30 years. So, I mean, that's, a, that's not a lot compared to a lot of guys. A lot of guys, by the time they get my age, have been doing it for, you know, 40 or 50 years. But uh, one of the things that we have to do sometimes as pastors that we really don't like to do is we have to try to help people when they're in trouble. And uh, whether it be a funeral, whether it be somebody in the hospital, whether it be uh, a sudden injury, whether it be a marital problem, a uh, financial problem, uh, whatever the problem is, a lot of times we have to help people uh, in a time of tragedy. And through the years, what I have noted uh, among people that were outside the church and what I've noted actually, unfortunately, from people inside the church is I would hear statements like, <clears throat> well, if Jesus really loved me, he wouldn't let this happen to me. In fact, maybe at some point in time, we may have to have a time of confession here. Maybe at some point in time, uh, life has gotten tough on you and you've curled up in the fetal position and you've wondered if Jesus loved you. Who's ever curled up in the fetal position and wondered whether or not Jesus loved them? Let's just confess it and let's just be honest. Amen? It happens to all of us. And so we preach sermons like we're going to preach today to remind you who Jesus is and remind us who we are to Jesus. I've heard people say, well, a loving God wouldn't have let this child die. A loving God wouldn't have let this child fall into a well and be killed. I had a, a, a kid at our church that was two years old and fell into an old dry well and uh, suffocated, you know. So we've seen all of that and we've heard all those things. And you'll hear people that aren't Christians say, well, you know, loving God's, uh, you know, I uh, let the Christians tell me about a loving God now, now that these people have been killed in this nightclub or that this has happened or this has happened or this tsunami has killed 250,000 people. Just, just tell me, Christians, about your loving God. But what people don't understand is they, number one, they don't understand who God is, not really. Hopefully all Christians do, but all Christians don't really totally understand who God is. And they certainly don't, all Christians don't understand, even though they might be saved, they don't understand who Jesus is. And they really don't understand what the world's all about right now. They think that this is God's creation, and this is the way that God created it, and this is the way he meant it to be. And of course, God did create the world, God did create the universe, God did create all things, but the world is not the way that he created it to be. And the reason that man is not the way he meant God meant him to be, and the reason the world is not the way that God meant it to be, God never meant there to be disease in the world. God never meant to there be physical death in the world. God never meant for all of these tragedies to occur. God never meant for there to be earthquakes and disturbances and pestilence and all of those things in the world. That was man's doing. When Adam sinned in the Garden of Eden, he brought ruin upon mankind as a whole, and he brought ruin upon God's creation. And so when you see these things, these horrible things that happen in the world today, and you see these accidents, and you see these diseases and things that come about, it's not God's doing. It's man's doing. And it's the result of a three-letter word, sin. And a lot of people wink at sin. A lot of people make jokes about sin. But brothers and sisters, sin is the reason that Jesus had to die on the cross. Amen? And so at Christmas time, uh, the picture that has been in my mind all week long as I prepared for this sermon is all week long I've envisioned in my mind, getting ready for this sermon, I've envisioned a manger with a cross behind it. Because at Christmas we think of the baby Jesus, that little baby in a manger, but that little baby in the manger came to die on a cross. Imagine someone taking that baby out of that manger and hanging that baby on the cross. Well, that's the same difference. That's why Jesus came. He came for one purpose, and that was to die on the cross. And you say, well, I, I just, and some people just don't get that, but I take people all the time when I'm witnessing to somebody, I take them to Isaiah chapter 59. So listen to what God says here to Isaiah. 
Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear, but your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. For your hands are stained with blood, your fingers are stained with guilt, your lips have spoken lies, and your tongue mutters wicked things. No one calls for justice. No one pleads his case with integrity. They rely on empty arguments and they speak lies. They conceive trouble and they give birth to evil. They hatch the eggs of vipers and spin a spider's web. Whoever here eats their eggs will die, and when one is broken, an adder is hatched. Their cobwebs are useless for clothing. They cannot cover themselves with what they make. Their deeds are evil deeds, and their acts of violence are in their hands. Their feet rush into sin. They are swift to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are evil thoughts. They run to destruction, and destruction marks their ways. The way of peace they do not know. There is no justice in their paths. They have turned them into crooked roads. No one who walks in them will know peace. Now, that's not the enemies of Israel that God was speaking of. That's all of us. And you notice what it says there. It says that their sins have separated them from me. And God says, it's not that I can't hear them. It says their sins prevent me from hearing them. So when someone says sometimes to you, hey, I'm praying for you, you know, you, you want to say, well, are you a believer in Christ? Because brothers and sisters, if they're not a believer in Christ, they got no one to pray to for you. They can say they're going to pray to God all day long for you, but if they're not a believer in Christ, God's not going to hear their prayer. He'll hear their prayer, Lord, save me, but he will not hear their prayer because they've been separated from God by their sin. So God looked at this situation. He created man to be the object of his love. You have to understand that. God created man, put him in the Garden of Eden to be the object of his love. But man sinned, and that sin separated man from God. And you might say, say, well, you know, God, uh, you know, made co coats for them when they left the Garden of Eden, and that was a sign that through sacrifice they could approach God. Yes, sacrifice and blood sacrifice, they could approach God, but only looking forward to the coming of the Redeemer. Without the Redeemer, all of those blood sacrifices that Israel offered, without the Redeemer, all of those animals that were slaughtered, without the Redeemer, those things meant nothing because they were temporary. They were, <laughs> they were not redemption, they were atonement, looking forward to the day that the Redeemer would come and make those sacrifices a reality, an eternal reality. That's who Jesus is. And so it says here in Isaiah 59, powerful, powerful passage of Scripture, it says that God looked, in verse 16, that God looked and there was no man, and he was appalled that there was no man. What does that mean? That's really important. He looked at mankind, past, present, future. There was not one man that God could use to be the redeemer for mankind. Why? Because all had sinned. So all were guilty. All were separated from God. And as a sinner, that person could not be the redeemer for sinners. But good, the good news is, though, is that right after that it says, so God's own hand worked salvation for him, and his own righteousness sustained him. What does that mean? That means that God looked around. There was no man that could be man's redeemer, so he chose to be mankind's redeemer. It says down in verse 20 here, it says, the Redeemer will come to Zion to those in Jacob who repent of their sins, declares the Lord. So God looked at the world. He saw only sin. He saw sin in mankind. He saw sin in nature. He saw sin had ruined his creation. Man looked for, had God looked for a hero. There was no hero because all had sinned and come short of the glory of God. So man said, okay, okay. I'll be their redeemer. Now think about what that means. The creator who created us, the creator who created the universe, the creator who created, created everything large, everything small, all everything that we know about, can think about, can conceive, said, I love man so much that he can't save himself, and so I'll become his redeemer. Over in 
don't look this up, but over in Jeremiah 23, 6, it says, in the days of the branch, the branch being Jesus, Judah and Israel will live in safety, and this is the name by which the branch will be called, the Lord our righteousness, Jehovah Sid Canoe, meaning that God is going to be the Savior of the world. Now, let me ask you a question. How can God be the Savior of the world? So when you're talking to somebody, you need to explain to them that the world's a mess, that evil things happen in this world because of sin. That's what you need to remember. And you need to remember that God chose to be the Savior of the world. So how did God, who is in glory, how did God, who is in glory, become the Savior of the world? Look over in John chapter 1. John chapter 1, verse 1. Now this is key. You got God in the third heaven in paradise, looks down upon man, man has no hope, and God says, reaches his arm down and says, okay, I will be their redeemer, I will save them. How? Here you go. Verse 1, in the beginning was the word, that's the Greek word logos, that means the exact representation of the thought or the person. And the word was with God and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life and that life was the light of men. And the light shined in the darkness, but the darkness uh, could not understand it. Who is the word? The word is Jesus. He is the word. He is the exact expression of God. Over in Hebrews it says he is the exact image of God. So you see, God is invisible, amen? No one has ever seen God, it says, except Jesus has come to portray God to us so that we could understand our Heavenly Father. Jesus came to be the Redeemer, God in the flesh. Look what it says in John chapter 1, verse 14. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us, and we have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Look at verse 18. No one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only, who is the Father's side, has made him known unto us. So Jesus came for two purposes. The first purpose was, was to die for our sins, to pay the penalty for our sins, to be the promised redeemer that God had promised from the time that Adam and Eve walked out of the garden. Since mankind didn't have a hero, God himself came and became our hero. And God in the flesh is called who? Jesus. Jesus is fully God. Jesus was fully man. That is so important because today when you talk to people of different faiths, different denominations, they don't understand who Jesus is. They don't understand salvation because they don't understand who Jesus is. They don't understand salvation because they don't understand the ugliness of sin. People today, like, you know, Buddhists and Hinduists, they think, well, we just live a good life and things will get better. But they don't understand that because of sin, things won't get better. They don't understand that God has given the world one chance through the Redeemer. And the Redeemer has been promised since they walked out of the Garden of Eden. And that Redeemer is Jesus Christ. That's the only Redeemer who has ever lived. That's the only Redeemer that can save mankind. And we've got that word in our heart, amen? And it is our responsibility to understand that and to explain that to the world. Jesus was not just a good teacher. Jesus not was a pro not just a prophet. Jesus was not just a healer. Jesus was the God-man, God in the flesh. And if you want to understand who God is, look at Jesus. Jesus loved everybody. Jesus healed everybody that had diseases. Jesus loved the little children. Jesus helped people everywhere he could. Jesus fed people. Jesus expressed the love of the Father in his life unto us so that we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God loves us. God loves me. Let's all say that. God loves me. And the evidence that God loves me is the cross of Jesus Christ. So this Christmas season, every time you look at that baby in the manger, imagine that baby hanging on the cross because that's what God did for us. Let's go over and look at, uh, let's conclude today and look over in 1 John chapter 4. <clears throat> I call 1 John chapter 4 is really, uh, I call it the love chapter in the Bible. Now, most people call 1 Corinthians chapter 13 the love chapter in the Bible. That's the chapter that 
uh, girls, when they get married, they want uh, the pastor to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And that's a good passage of Scripture, no doubt. Uh, but 1 John chapter 4 is the love chapter of the Bible. If you're ready to take a look at this, this with me, say amen. So God determined to come down and be our Savior. God in the flesh is the person we know as Jesus Christ. So why did he come? It says here, dear friends, verse 7, 1 John 4, 7. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. So if you've been born of God, if you've been born again through faith in Jesus Christ, you know love and you know God. If you know God, say amen. Jesus said in John chapter 17, verse 3, this is the definition for eternal life, that you know God, that you know me, and that you are known by us. So knowing God is the definition of eternal life. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. The very nature of God is love. And that's not just regular love. That's not filial love. That's not eros love. That is agape love. That is unconditional love. The world had never totally had anything like that, that thought thrust upon them. But that's God loving us unconditionally. Now you listen to me. If you're listening, say amen. <clears throat> when you love with agape, the object of your love, you seek to meet their most desperate need. Now, maybe you think your most desperate need is financial. Maybe you think your most desperate need is uh, a good job. Maybe you think your most desperate need is a new car, a new house, whatever. That is not our most desperate need. Our most desperate need is to have our sins forgiven so that we can spend eternity with God in heaven. Amen? And after that flows God wanting to meet all of our other needs through Jesus Christ. In other words, when we go to the world and we tell them about Jesus, we don't want to start by saying, well, Jesus will feed you. We don't want to start by saying, well, Jesus will heal you. We don't want to start there. We want to start that Jesus will save you from your sins. And we want to show the world that just like all of us were before we were saved, the world is under the conviction and the condemnation of sin. So sin is the key. Sin is the key to salvation. If you want to be saved, what do you want to be saved from? The condemnation of sin. And it's our responsibility to explain that to the world. Then it's our responsibility to explain that the reason that God the Father became Jesus Christ in the flesh to die on the cross was because of his great love for us. We are the object of God's love. We individually, the earth is not the object of God's love. Even the nation Israel is not the object of God's love. Uh, the, the universe is not the, the object of God's love. We, as human beings, created by God in His image, we are the object of God's love. Let's all say that. I am the object of God's love. Personalize it. I am the object of God's love. When times are hard, I am the object of God's love. When things look bleak, I am the object of God's love. When things aren't going right, I am the object of God's love. When you're in that fetal position, you don't know what to do, you don't know what to pray, you don't know what to say, I am the object of God's love. Remember the cross. Remember the manger, but remember the cross. So it says here, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Amen? At this Christmas season, we need to remember the love of God. But God says something, God never lets us off the hook. And so in his word here, in verse 20, do you love God? If you love God, say amen. Verse 20, if anyone says, I love God, yet he hates his brother, he is a liar. For anyone who does not love his brother whom he can see cannot love God whom he has not seen. And he has given us this commandment, whosoever loves God must also love his brother. The only commandment that Jesus gave us was over there in John chapter 15. 
And Jesus said, this commandment I give you, you shall love one another as I have loved you. That's even a greater commandment than the golden rule. The golden ro rule says you shall love your, uh, your neighbor as you love yourself. But some people don't love themselves that much. Jesus took it a step further. He says, you shall love one another as I have loved you. So does Jesus love everybody? You betcha. Does he love the sinner? Yes. Does he love the saint? Yes. Does he love the Muslim? Yes. Does he love the people on the other side of the world never heard about him? Absolutely. And so if he loves those individuals, what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to love one another as Jesus has loved us. I don't know about you, but when I think about the fact that God loves me, I sometimes wonder how in the world he could love me. I don't know. I'm pretty realistic with uh, understanding who I am and who I've been and the things I've done in my life. And I wonder how could God love me. That's why they call it amazing love. Because in spite of ourselves, God still loves us. In fact, we don't have to perform for God. Some people think that they have to go do a lot of really good stuff so that God will love them. No. God loves us in spite of ourselves. God loves us when we do great things. God loves us when we're stinkers. So this Christmas season is about love. And it's not just us saying we love God. It's by allowing the love that God has placed in each one of us. See, all of us that here who are believers in Christ, if you're a believer in Christ, say amen. We've been baptized into the body of Christ through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit lives and dwells in us, and it says in here that we have the love of God in us through the Spirit. So the love of God that loved the world, that loves the world unconditionally, that desires to meet the needs of the world, that same love is in each one of us. But as believers in Christ, like all the other gifts of the Spirit, we have to release that. We have to let that reign and rule in our lives. See, what happens in our life is what we let happen in our life. So we have to let the love of God reign and rule in our lives. Father, I thank you for the day. I thank you, Lord, for your great love for us, for me. Uh, it's beyond comprehension that you love us, Lord. Beyond comprehension, but you do. And the evidence of that is your cross. And the evidence of that is that you came out of glory to become our Lord and our Savior. You died on the cross, allowed yourself to be buried in the grave, and you came out of the grave to give us hope for all of eternity. Lord, I pray that everybody in the room today has that hope in their life. I pray that everybody in the room today is a believer in Jesus Christ, is born again by the power of the Spirit of God. I pray that all of us in this room today will release ourselves so that we could experience the gifts of the Spirit which are fulfilled ultimately in great love in our lives. I pray, Lord, that we would feel your love in our life, and I pray, Lord, in return, we would let that love flow out of us into the world. Lord, you want to love the world, but you want to love the world through us. I pray that you would teach us that lesson today. I pray, Lord, that all week long we would meditate on that and we would think on that and we would allow your love to flow through us into a very dark, very unfriendly world. Lord, the world needs you. You've died on the cross for them and they don't even know it. You've died on the cross for them and some of them have rejected it. But Lord, you still love them and you expect us to still love them. And you expect us to do what's necessary to let them know that you still love them. So, Lord, I pray that you would motivate us with that today. I pray that you'd send us out of here like fierce lions, taking your gospel into a very lost world, especially during this Christmas season, this season of love. We love you, Lord, and we praise your holy name. And everybody said, amen.